Well, hey, South Lake family. My name is Matt, and I am the middle school pastor here. And whether you are rocking a tee, a button up, or full on onesie PJs, we are so grateful that you are here to worship with us today. He 
worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you. I worship you. Yes, you are. Keep 
Yes, the name of Jesus is beautiful and wonderful and powerful. And why do we declare that in song? Well, it's because our sin separates us from God and because God is full of justice and he's holy and he's perfect, he cannot tolerate sin or just sweep it under the rug. And so out of his love for us, he sent his son, Jesus to reconcile us to him. He sent Jesus so that we could be made right with him, so that we could be made at peace with him. And when we accept what Jesus did on the cross on our behalf, we become part of God's family. But God doesn't just reconcile us to himself, he actually calls us to reconcile ourselves to each other. In fact, in Matthew chapter five, these are the words of Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. The people who make peace, those are the people that are in the family of God. And this week, our neighbors to the north in Kenosha experienced anything but peace. Jacob Blake was shot in the back seven times. Families from our church had to evacuate their homes because of violence in the streets. Buildings burned and there was night after night of unrest. And I think we all want peace. But let's pay close attention to the words of Jesus here. Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. You see, to keep peace is to avoid, to stuff down, to ignore pain. But to make peace is to uncover pain, to work towards reconciliation. And reconciliation always comes at a cost. Our reconciliation to God came at the price of Jesus' life. Reconciliation isn't easy, but it's the kind of life that God calls his children to. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Peacekeepers avoid and ignore, but peacemakers, they uncover and restore. And so church, my prayer for us is that we would be people that make peace and that can only happen through the powerful name of Jesus. We need Jesus to intervene. My prayer is that community leaders and law enforcement would come together and forge a new way forward. My prayer is that there would be peaceful protests in the street. My prayer is that there would be peace in our families and in our hearts, but it wouldn't be a false peace, a peacekeeping kind of peace, but it would be a peace that comes through work and uncovering pain and true reconciliation. So will you join me in praying for that now? God, we acknowledge that on our own, we cannot make peace. We need your intervention, Jesus. God, we pray for peace uh, for Jacob Blake and for his family. God, we pray for his healing. God, we pray that um, his pain would not be in vain. God, we pray for peace uh, between law enforcement and our communities, peace that must be worked hard for. God, we pray for peace in our communities. We pray that you show us the ways that we can make peace in our homes, in our circles of influence, whatever we can do to usher in your kind of peace. God, would you show us the way? And we know it's only possible by your wonderful and powerful name. It's in your name we pray, amen. Good morning, Willow South Lake. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here, and it has been great to worship with you. And we get to learn together here in just a few minutes from Megan Marshman. It's going to be a great time of learning. But before we get there, we want to make sure that you're aware of the things that are happening right here in the life of our church at Willow South Lake. One thing is on September 13th, we are gonna be doing our fall kickoff. We are really excited about this because that Sunday morning, we will be meeting live and in person at nine and at 11 o'clock outside in our parking lot. 
we do need you to re uh, reserve a spot for this time. It's gonna be fantastic, but you gotta go online to wslathome.org and you can sign up there to get a spot so that you can come and worship and be together that morning. It's gonna be a great time. Dave Dummett will be here with us live. He's our new senior pastor, so it's gonna be a great time for you to meet him and see him in person. Now, tonight, I want you to know that we have a men's gathering taking place right here in our parking lot. We're gonna play some bags, we're gonna hang out. It's gonna be a great time. Please come at 5.30 tonight, all the men of our church, and just come and hang out. It'll be a time of community. It's gonna be really, really good. I look forward to seeing you there tonight. Now, we also have a women's gathering coming up. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Barb to tell you about that. Ladies of Willow South Lake, I am so excited to invite you all to our very next women's gathering on Thursday night, September 10th at eight o'clock. You can go to our website to sign up, but I wanna let you know a little bit about what you're gonna expect that night. Gina is gonna be speaking to us. We're gonna be focusing on some self-care and she's gonna be speaking live. You're gonna have two opportunities, two different ways actually to experience the evening. One is virtual, in your jammies at home, on your computer, no problem. The second way is through a watch party. You'll actually have your small group time with the women live. So we will be distanced, we will be masked, we'll be safe. So I'm looking forward to seeing you. Go to wslathome.org slash connect and sign up. Thanks, Barb. It sounds like that women's gathering is gonna be a great time. Now, in order for us to keep doing the things that we feel that God is asking us to do, we depend on the generosity of our church. There are multiple ways for you to give. One way is online, germ-free, digitally. You can go to wslathome.org slash give and you can give to our church right there. And that helps push forward the mission of this church. But also, if you wanna write a check, you can do that and drop it in the mail. Send it to 625 Barclay Boulevard and we are checking our mail regularly. Thank you so much for the ways that you give generously and sacrificially. It really does make a difference. Now today, we get to hear a fantastic message from Megan Marshman. So let's turn it over to Megan now. I really love my role at Willow. I love every opportunity to share truth with you. I love that this truth goes through my life first. I love, I love getting to preach it as a woman and as a mom. Recently, I was reflecting on being a mom. My husband, who you've heard me talk about before, he's a really good dad. I mean, he's an ER nurse. <laughs> he knows when one of our boys falls off their bike, whether or not they're okay or, or really injured. He reminds me at times not to overreact and stir up more panic in my boys when everything's gonna be okay. But you know what I love? I'm still their mom. And I love the uniqueness of my role in that even though my husband knows whether or not they're injured, I'm their mom and I just wanna run to their side, scoop them up and be right there with them in their pain. I wanna be present with them anytime they feel like they're hurting. And friends, the reason I bring this up is because as I was preparing this message entitled, Jesus Over Discontent, I felt this invitation to speak to you as a mom. I felt that what you didn't need was a motivational lecture on contentment. Be content. You already have everything you need, so get up, keep going, get back on the bike, stop comparing, stop waiting for things to change, stop wishing you were someone else, you're fine, you're okay, get back up and ride again. While those are true, and I could probably motivate you, I felt this need to take a different posture not to speak at you or to shout at you or tell you to get up quickly. I felt invited as someone who cares deeply for you to rush to your side. Not, and I felt the need to just get on your level and then look you in the eyes and lean in and then ask, how are you doing? How are you doing specifically in the area of contentment? In due time, I will tell you, it is gonna be okay but I couldn't rush you past right where you're at. Rather, I wanted to be present with you in it so that you can join me and learn what Paul learned. See, in Philippians chapter four, as we finish this series, Paul says he's learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Wow. Do you know the secret of being content in the face of anything? Now, let me be clear. 
When I say content, I'm not talking about just complacency or lazy or just not driven or I'm just content, whatever, about life. No, no, no. I'm talking about true biblical contentment, this deep rest in your soul, trusting God, that you're okay even when everything around you is not okay. If you have been struggling to even face the day, maybe face your family, face all the politics in life, your future, or maybe you're scared about your past, or maybe you just can't even remember why you're anxious in the first place and your soul is just never at rest, this message is for you. You see, Paul is in prison facing potential death, yet he's completely content and at peace. What a timely message, what a timely topic. You see, because I think we're all after what Paul has already found. Let's learn from him. Philippians chapter four, beginning in verse 10, Paul writes this to the Philippian church that had just sent him gifts. He writes, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord that at last you, referencing the Philippian church, you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this, though, because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. In other words, he understands anywhere that we could be at. And I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Paul understood contentment. Contentment, by the way, is being satisfied and at rest about where God has you now, regardless of what's going on around you. You see, contentment is just, it's living satisfied with what God has given you and not expecting more or thinking you deserve more or comparing yourself with others and then wanting more. No, no, no. Paul was content with where he was at because he trusted that God had him there on purpose. Listen to his words. In fact, in chapter one, he doesn't just tell other people to be content or tell other people he knows the secret. He models it. Listen to him talking about his present circumstance. Chapter one, verse 12 says this. Now, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. He's where he's at for Christ. Do you know that where you're at is for Christ? He goes on, verse 14, and because of my chains. Most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Verse 14 doesn't say, even in my chains, he says, because of them. Because of them, the gospel is moving on because of precisely where I'm at. See, Paul found purpose in his present placement, even though he probably didn't like it either. And then... When anything good came his way, anything at all, he trusted it as a completely undeserved gift from God. In fact, listen to his thank you. Chapter four is where he writes the specific thank yous to the Philippian church because they had brought him gifts and food and money. They basically saved his life. And here's how he says thanks. Verse 10, chapter four. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you didn't have any opportunity to show it. I'm not saying this because I am in need, for I've learned to be content in whatever the circumstances. I'm kind of laughing because Paul's writing a thank you note, but he's kind of bad at writing thank you notes because it's like he's saying this, hey, uh, I rejoice in the Lord for everything you've given to me. Thank you, by the way, and I didn't need it. (laughs) What? You see, Paul was content before the gift. And then when he receives the gift, he's still just as content and he's grateful to God for the gift. You see, Paul sees that everything he has is a gift. It's undeserved. And when you get a gift, what do you do? You celebrate, you say thanks. In fact, the word rejoice means celebrate. Notice six verses earlier, chapter four, verse four, Paul writes to the Philippians and he tells them, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. And then six verses later, he says, here's how I'm rejoicing. He's taking his own advice. Notice though, where he's rejoicing, verse 10, I rejoiced greatly in the Lord. See, Paul credits God with everything. Do you want contentment? Do you want to live 
like Paul, he even tells us what to do. Verse 9, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Where Paul's beginning the conversation on contentment is he's telling us to practice rejoicing in the Lord for everything he's given you. Everything you have is undeserved. And so therefore, instead of thinking about what could be better because things could always be better, choose to celebrate what you have. In fact, this is where I began on this journey. As I started studying this passage, I made a list. Here's what I did. I made a list of everything I have that I don't deserve. And I'll tell you, even as I was writing the list, things inside me began to change. What do I have that I don't deserve? My family, love, a car, friendships, grace. Some got deep, some got uber spiritual, some were just really simple. It felt like Thanksgiving dinner at a quiet time, everything I have that I don't deserve. Thanks be to God. Then. I made a list of everything I thought I deserved that I didn't have. In other words, all these areas of my life that I thought that I deserved something, like life to be easier, that I didn't have. But the truth is, before I wrote anything on that second list, I realized nothing belongs on the second list because everything I, everything I thought I deserved that I didn't have, there's nothing there. You see, we can practice what Paul preached, and we too can rejoice. You see, rejoicing is powerful. It's realized that what, where you're at is precisely where you need to be. And when you begin to rejoice there, you'll see that it's not just powerful, it's also contagious. My husband ran into an old friend recently and they were just giving a few life updates. And then there was a surprising turn in the conversation. It was this idea of rejoicing in the Lord. Here's what happened. My husband had shared just kind of a little thing that had happened in his life to which this old friend responds with, what? Yes, praise the Lord. My husband's like, oh, y- yeah, yeah, praise, praise the Lord. And then my husband asked him, like, what's, what's going on in your life? The guy shares, he actually shared a big one. He said, you know what? We just bought a house, to which my husband, who had th- so far in the conversation had remained pretty mellow, hyped up and went, you know what? Yes, congratulations, good for you. And the guy's like, yeah. And then he goes, what about you? My husband shared another thing. And the guy's like, yeah, can you imagine all the people surrounding them looking in going, What in the world are these two gentlemen doing in this public space? Outdoors with masks on six feet away. (laughs) They were rejoicing. And then my husband came back and it was like he was walking on clouds. I said, what, what, hi. He said, can I just tell you the most, the biggest surprise of my day? Celebrating what I already have. And then celebrating someone else too. See, when you're content, you cannot just rejoice in what you have. You even can begin to celebrate what God has given to others too. Can I tell you this? Living content is powerful because it's saying, yes, I'm so content with what I have, where I'm at, that now I can begin to even celebrate you. You see, content people are free from comparison. Do you long to be free from comparison, friends? Comparison will breed discontentment for the rest of your life. In fact, it will destroy your ability to rejoice. You should have seen me after my husband and I's conversation when he's walking on cloud nine. I wanted to walk there too. So what I did is I went to the place where I find the most comparison, social media. And what I did that day, I rejoiced. I started scrolling because typically you scroll, right? And then you compare. I'm not there. Man, I'm not there. I don't have that, right? This day I decided to switch it up because I wanted to live and obey Paul's precise words right here and rejoice in everything. It's a gift from the Lord. You should have seen me. New baby, amazing, praise the Lord. Anniversary, nine years, woohoo! If some of you received these on your social media, all of my enthusiasm, it's because I wanted to experience what Paul had found and even in the beginning to practice it, I got a taste of what he's talking about. Church, it is time to celebrate what God has given you right where you're at, but you got to remember who's giving it to you. you got to remember who you're rejoicing in. Over this past month, I've been studying contentment, and I've learned, I keep learning, (laughs) but I've been learning it in surprising ways. I haven't just magically arrived at contentment. God's given me tastes of it when I'm free from being merely aware of myself. And I'm learning more about what it is and what it isn't. And I've been encouraged by Paul's words, Philippians 4, 11, and 12. Twice in these verses, Paul claims to have learned contentment, learned it. And here's, and here's the truth. Here's how God's teaching me. It gives me hope that he had to learn it too. But he's teaching me slowly, which by the way is a direct opposition to this instant gratification world. 
here's how he's been doing it. I've been faced with areas in my life where, to be honest with you, I'm discontent. But he's used it to allow me to learn contentment. You know what I've also become aware of is all the areas I've tried to find contentment in unreliable places, like life going well, relationships being easy, a church building, (laughs) stable finances. But what happens when this five-month-long pandemic messes with everything, our finances, security, safety? And what happens when people turn out to be really imperfect? I love the way Bob Goff puts it. He says, hey, love hard people. You're one of them. (laughs) See, if contentment is being satisfied and at rest with where God has you, then discontentment, you'll find discontentment when you're wanting to be somewhere else with someone else, doing something else. But remember Paul's words. He says this in verse 12. He says, no, 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 but I have learned to be content in any and every situation. He doesn't say he's content with his situation, to be clear, but he's content in it. He also doesn't say that he's content or he'll be content when a situation changes. This was a massive awakening for me on this area of why I find myself discontent, and it's this. You too may assume that when something changes, then we can be content. Have you done it? When things go back to normal, then I'll be content. Or when so-and-so, when my kids go back to school, (laughs) then I'll be content. Church, when, then is a myth. If you're not content now, you won't be content when. Contentment will not be found when something changes, but it is possible now. It can be found on the ground right where you're at. Do you remember my boys falling off their bikes You see, as a mom, I didn't run to them and tell them just to get up, keep going, be somewhere else already, be better at riding your bike. No, no, no. I come to their side and I meet them where they're at and we process through the pain so that I can help them get up and go again. And God is doing the same thing with us. You see, he meets us right where we're at, right where you're at, right behind the screen watching this. If you're tired, you're feeling pain, unmotivated to keep going or maybe even ready to give up. The truth is, we haven't just like fallen off a bike, but I do believe a lot of us are missing out on this life-giving secret to contentment. Or maybe we've ignored it. We've distracted ourselves from thinking about hard things. We've turned on Netflix, grabbed social media, grabbed a drink, or just got distracted. I believe God has put it heavy on my heart to whisper at just the right time these words from Paul, telling you about God's heart, because God's heart is not just to tell you that you can be okay. He wants to come to your side and attend to the pain, so you, the pain that we could easily ignore so that you can find a true contentment right where you're at before the pain goes away before it gets easier, before COVID ends, because right where you're at is where God wants to meet you, where he wants to be your strength. But are you willing to wrestle with the ways you've been trying to find contentment? It's a journey. Paul says it has to be learned. And Or, or will you just keep on ignoring it? Just keep getting up on your own, trying harder, fix your feelings, buy a bunch of new stuff, compare yourself with other people, obsess over the future, and hope that one day things will change, change honestly? I too have tried to find contentment in my own strength or things changing. I too have been waiting for contentment to come at me. And I too even experienced it writing this message. I did something I've never done. In the middle of writing this message, I took my pen and I threw it. I was so frustrated. Why can't I figure contentment out? Why can't I just put it in a simple A, B, C, step one, two, three? Why can't I just give it to him in easy ways? But the truth is it's a wrestle, but it's also a relationship. See, there I went again. Why did I throw my pen? Because I was trying to trust in myself and my own strength to figure everything out. Have you been there? Each frustration, though, I saw was part of God's process for me. Now let me welcome you into your process with this. Where have you been running to satisfy the deep longings in your soul to find contentment? A job? People? Maybe stuff? It? or he or she cannot carry the weight of your contentment. 
and your ability to achieve won't make you more content either. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said this in Ecclesiastes 4.4. 4. He said, all toil and all achievement, it just springs from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless. It's a chasing after the wind. It's impossible. You see, I don't want you to spend the rest of your life or even another day chasing wind. You see, your time is far too valuable to waste any of it chasing after wind. I mean, it's actually impossible to try to capture wind. You see, when you find those feelings of inadequacy come about and comparison begins to take over, or you log into that website and you think, maybe this purchase will help me feel a little bit better in this crazy season. Would you remember this phrase from Solomon and even preach it to yourself in those moments when you're grasping to find it on your own strength? This too is a chasing after the wind. It won't fix what's off in my soul. But Paul doesn't leave us there. He wants us to do the dipe deep and wrestle deep and then wrestle there, but then he leads us to the secret. And I know this because he's led me there too. And Paul shares the secret. And I love that he even calls it a secret. It's kind of like a little kid. I have a secret. It's about you. (laughs) It's about you being okay. Can you imagine him? And then he gets all of us to lean in. I think that's why he's doing it. I wonder if he just does this to get us all to lean in and want to know and hunger for it. You ready for it? Here's what it is. Verse 13. Paul says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. That's the secret. Philippians 4.13. I got to be honest with you. Philippians 4.13 was the verse I wrote on my basketball shoes in high school. 4.13, I wanted to remember, I could do all things. I could become great. In high school, I didn't understand Philippians 4.13. See, I thought Philippians 4.13 was about me, and it was the secret to greatness. And now I'm reminded with this context of Paul's actual words in Philippians 4.13, it is not a secret to achieving greatness. It's the secret to being content, even if you never do. And friends, here's the secret. The secret to contentment has a name. The secret to contentment is Jesus. It's him, it's not you, it's not your abilities, it's him. And I'm sure some of you are, this comes as no surprise, you're probably rolling your eyes, yeah, I'm sure. The Jesus over series, of course, he's the answer, but friends, this is not just something to know. It's someone else to trust as your strength. And maybe some of you agree and then you're just there. If you're thinking, you know, I wish I could be content like this and trust Jesus as my strength, but Maybe, honestly, if you're sitting there, you're going, I don't even know where to begin. So you maybe like this message, but you shrug it off and you move on. Can I tell you this? Would you just lean in, lean in a little further? Let me tell you, it's not that you can't trust in Christ. It's more a matter of you finally needing to refuse to trust yourself. You are already living a life of trust. It's actually not that complicated. But the truth is, your trust has been in you, your strength and your ability to find satisfaction or achieve it. Or maybe you're trusting in others or stuff or being somewhere else or circumstances changing. You're trying to satisfy your own soul and be content. Hear these words from the Apostle Paul into your soul. You can be content, but it's not found in you. It's not found in what you can achieve. See, the problem with achievement is the second you get one goal, the goalpost moves. (laughs) The American dream is like a carrot on a stick. We keep on grasping, chasing the wind. In fact, 100 years ago, the richest man was interviewed and said, hey, hey, uh, how much money is enough? You want to know his response? Just a little bit more. Everyone chuckled in the interview. But I think it's how we live. We're chasing. We're trying to find contentment. And the truth is we can't find it in ourselves or what we can achieve. Friends, hear Paul's words. It's only found in Christ. Because here's the truth about Christ. Where we couldn't reach or achieve perfection, perfection came to us. Jesus accomplished what we have failed to achieve, and then he invites us to receive what only he deserved, deserved. And herein lies the key. Back to where we started. True contentment 
is understanding what you really deserve and understanding that what you deserve is nothing. How does that strike you? I know these words, by the way, are so countercultural. See, commercials are screaming, get what you deserve. You worked hard for it. You deserve it. But God's word shouts a very different message. Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of our sin, the wages of our lives is death. It's a separation from God. What we deserve is to be very far from God, hopeless and alone, empty, yet contentment can be found when you realize God didn't give you what you actually deserve. Instead, by grace, Jesus came to you, and he's still coming alongside you. Turn and look at him. Get, be free from being merely aware of yourself. Look at him. You'll find what you're looking for, and in him, you'll find everything you need to face the day. See, Paul didn't expect God to bring him somewhere easier. He knew what he deserved, and he's not the only one. Let me end with this. The person in my life who I believe is most content, most free, says he no longer trusts in himself. He said he sees his shortcomings and he's experienced the really awful consequences of his sin. But he said most importantly, he sees and experiences Jesus in his grace. In his own words, he said this, to find contentment, you have to start with what you deserve. And I know I deserve nothing. Knowing the grace of Jesus reminds me that anything I have, I don't deserve. Purpose. I've been given a purpose, position, influence, people around me. Everything I have is all icing. And I've learned, he said, that you can't live on icing. But man, you can enjoy icing. But you can't survive on it. Ask any health professional. You can find glimpses. Have you noticed you can find glimpses and tastes of contentment on, of God's good and all the icing around us? You can, and you can enjoy it, but you can't live on it. This week, I invite you to join me to find the glimpses or feelings of contentment. Yes, in the icing, in dinner table conversations, in good music, wonderful sights, your job, in eye contact, in relationships, yes, they can stir your affection towards Jesus, but let me tell you, they can't make you content because guess what? They're not him. They're not perfect. They're not Jesus. Everything around us may reflect Jesus at times, but none can reflect Jesus perfectly. This week, let's not look to the things that stir our affection for Jesus to be the places we search for ultimate, ultimate satisfaction because they won't work. But they, the places we experience types and feelings and moments of contentment, they can be enjoyed. So we find ourselves back to the beginning with Paul's invitation. Rejoice in the Lord in everything. Why? You don't have what you deserve, sure, but you already have everything you need in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, help us to find you in things, not look to those things for satisfaction, but celebrate those things as gifts. God, thank you. Help us to go on this deep journey, not to agree with a sermon, but to go on a journey with you. Help us look at you more often, find our satisfaction in you. Help us, Lord, we pray. And all God's children said, amen. One more thing, today we're gonna to practice contentment together. Here's how, by rejoicing in the Lord and singing one more song. Are you in church? Are you in? This song, by the way, was written by a man in his deepest season of loss. Maybe that's true for you, but here's what he understood. He understood true contentment, that it's well with his soul. This man knew Jesus. Let's join him in this worshipful song before anything changes and trust Jesus that it is already well with our soul too. Let's sing and experience the contentment that's available through Christ. And when peace like a river attendeth my way When so
Thou hast taught me to say it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well, it is well with my soul, with my soul, it is well. from Philippians chapter 4 verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. God, I pray that we would know your peace this week. God, I pray that it would be well with our souls, not because of our circumstances, but because you are with us. Jesus, we look to you for our peace, for our joy, and for our contentment this week. Would you meet us? We pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. So good to be with you today, church. Now stick around in just a couple minutes. Our family service is going to start.
welcome to our family service. You may be wondering what I'm doing here. Well, I'm actually looking through our family album. I like to look through it every once in a while to remember all the fun that we've had as a family. Celebrating birthdays, doing fun things and silly things on trips maybe during the summer or the winter break. Speaking of remembering, today's memory verse talks to us a little bit about that. And here's Innie from our 45 room to tell us a little more. Hi, my name is Innie. Remember the days of long ago. Think about what the Lord did through those many years. That was great, Innie. Hi, friends. It's Koke here. Let's say the verse again with motions. Hey, right, I'm going to do this slowly. Are you follow me? Remember the days of long ago. Think about what the Lord did through those many years. Let's try that again. Remember the days of long ago. Think about what the Lord did through those many years. Let's all stand up and raise our arms high and sing about God's love for us. Surround it, sur around it. Your love is everywhere and I'm surrounded. It's got me singing, it's got me shouting. And now I want to tell the world about it. Promise Land friends, my name is Mr. Josh, and I'm so glad you guys are with us here today for our family service. And our lesson comes from that verse out of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 32, 7, to remember the days of long ago and to think about what the Lord did through those many years. It was such an important message for the Israelites at that time. In fact, in the book of Deuteronomy, God reminds the Israelites 23 times of things they should be remembering. And that message was important to them then, and it's important for us today to be able to look back and see and think about all the ways God has been there for us. Because when we do that, that gives us the strength and the faith to make it through the things and the challenges that we have today or that we have in the future. When we think about the Israelites, that God had rescued them out of Egypt, saved them from slavery. God had separated the Red Sea. They had watched the water split so they could cross on dry land. He fed them as they wandered through the desert, giving them bread and water and protection. 
They had so many examples to look back on and to remember that where God had been with them all along the way. And promise and friends, God is with us the same way. He is helping us throughout each day, each week, each month, each year. And so our challenge is to be able to look back and to see and to think and just meditate on those times that God has been there with us. Now, I was trying to think, what would be a fun way to do that? And instead of looking back into the past, I was wondering maybe we should time travel to the future and then look back on the past, which would be today's future. I know it's confusing, time travel always is. Now, unfortunately, we can't all time travel to the future, but I created a device, looks like a remote, but it's actually a very special device that is able to find me in the future and bring me back here with us. So we're gonna give this a shot, we're gonna see if it works. So with me, count down from three with me, here we go. Three, two, one. Whoa, guys, it worked! This is the best thing ever! I cannot believe it worked! And in the future, I look pretty much like I do today. There must be amazing age-defying creams in the future. Uh, no, there's no future age-defying cream, but um, well, first, hey, your, your machine worked. That is absolutely incredible, but uh, to break the news to you, it didn't work that well because I'm only from nine months into the future, so that's why I look pretty much exactly like you do. It's only nine months. And in fact, I think I was actually in the middle of teaching a Promise Land lesson when I showed up here, so I'm guessing I just disappeared from, from there. Uh, well, I'm, I'm so sorry about that. That wasn't my intention, but I'm so glad you're here and I can't believe it worked. Well, hey, we are in the middle of a lesson with our Promise Land friends about looking back on all the ways God has been there with us. Will, would you mind helping us with that lesson since you're from the future? I'm sure he can share some things for us here today. Yeah, that is such a great lesson. I'd be happy to. So it's so important that we always remember and look back on the years ago, right? And the t days ago and the months ago of all the things that God has done for us. And as I look back over the last nine months, so your future nine months, I can see where God has been there for us as we've all gotten back to school. And we get to now start learning again and seeing our friends, even if it's video, you know, via video screen. Um, I see more time and a lot of tough, fun times with family and friends and just good times like that where God has been with us. And for you or me, or I guess for us, I mean, good news, uh, nine months from now, you still have your hair. God hasn't let you go bald yet. Well, that is so cool. Well, I have to imagine you better get back to the future because people are gonna start wondering where in the world you went. But before you go, can you tell us who wins the Super Bowl? No. Wow, guys, I, I can't believe that worked. It was kind of weird to see my future self, though I'm glad nine months from now I still have my hair and everything's looking okay. Well, hey, this is such an important lesson. We had a little bit of fun, but Miss Donna has even more to this lesson to teach us how to look back and remember the ways that God has been there for us. So let's turn over to Miss Donna. Thanks, Mr. Josh. Hey, you've been holding out on us. I want to borrow that time travel mode, just saying. Um, I'm Miss Donna and want to share with you one way that my family will be applying this week's lesson and it's with a thankfulness jar. So what I have here is a clear jar that can be displayed anywhere in the home. Ours is in the kitchen. And what I've asked my family to do and to keep doing is jot down the things that God has done for us and just want to share with you some of the things um, that we in the Williams family are thankful for. Someone wrote more time together as a family as a result of Corona. Another person wrote, when someone walks Pacer, not me. I know who wrote this one. <laughs> uh, someone wrote, knowing that God has planned my future and I just need to follow his lead. Here's another one. The first week of school went well. So you get the idea by simply writing down some of the things that God has done, or even some of the things that you're praying for God to do. Here's a, a nice way to capture all that God is doing as a family you can reflect on and pray over. I hope that you find this application helpful and uh, I hope that you have a blessed week. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Bye, Promise Land families. Have a great week. Bye.